Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Today, uh, I want first to thank you for your letters and your questions, and uh, we answer them when we have the time. Our speaker today is Mr. Tom Ms. J. Kamira, a certified planner for many years and a registered licensed landscape architect. He is accredited with the Congress for the New Urbanism in the, and is a charter member of CNU, of the Congress of the New Urbanism. He was formerly a chair of the CNU Standards and President, oh, Precedence Task Force. Tom has continued his work and expanding since 1977, and he is assisted today by his associate, Aaron Groves. Over to you, Tom. Um, thank you, Dr. Durbeck. Um, very uh, delighted to be invited to do this session. Uh, we're calling Sustainable Practices in City Planning. And if Aaron could share the screen, uh, we'll go through our presentation. Um, thank you, Aaron. So um, <clears throat> we're, we're particularly excited about today because it's just one day away from the 51st anniversary of Earth Day and more about that later. But in this title slide, um, <clears throat> what we identify is that um, Proudly presented by Thomas Commit Associates Incorporated. We are town planners and landscape architects from Westchester, Pennsylvania. Uh, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary uh, in our practice in January of this year. And um, I am a certified planner accredited by the Congress for the New Urbanism and a registered landscape architect. Um, Aaron, could you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Aaron Gross. Um, I'm also a registered landscape architect in Pennsylvania and a town planner. Um, I've been working with Tom very closely for the past seven and a half years and we enjoy working together and uh, looking to ways that we can create sustainable and um, different development um, for our future. Thank you, Aaron. So in this title slide, um, and most of our slides have three images. Um, what we would like to focus on is that many cities initially were fortifications uh, like the ancient city plan of Jerusalem is in the, uh, was <clears throat> as shown in the top left slide. Um, and as cities were first uh, happening, they did uh, represent a compact, mixed-use, walkable place, often distinguished from its perimeter by walls or some topographic or hydrologic feature, and thereafter was the countryside. Um, the middle slide is the Nolly map of Rome, an excerpt of the map, and what Nolly thought was most appropriate was to highlight all the built environment in black so that the public space would be highlighted in white. So the street and pedestrian thoroughfare network is shown in white as are the plazas like the Piazza Navona, the largest white feature shown in the top left of the center slide. The right slide is a idealized diagram from 1937 that was drawn by Barry Parker. Parker and Unwin were partners in the United Kingdom and collaborated from about 1895 to about 1940, during which time uh, Sir Raymond Unwin wrote the 1909 treatise, Town Planning and Practice, and both Barry Parker and Raymond Unwin taught at many universities. One of the slides that they used in the late 1930s, this top right slide, depicts what an idealized region 
might look like by threading together and interconnecting cities with both mass transit and auto thoroughfares, and then having the agricultural countryside area as shown in the gray, and then an intervening area along the corridors where additional growth would be allowed. Realize that in the United Kingdom to this day, and in Germany, they very clearly are vigilant about urban growth boundaries. And that has informed several initiatives in the United States as well. But um, when I joined Dr. Durback in 1994 in Istanbul, Turkey, um, when we were presenting uh, smart growth strategies, uh, I actually showed this slide in the top right. So Aaron and I dug it out from the old TCA archives. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, we wanted to dedicate our presentation um, in several ways. Uh, top left slide is uh, the dear Rosaria Kamita, my mother who passed away three years ago. She would have been 100 on April 3rd, earlier this month. And um, there she is drawing a countryside from her native uh, city of Guadria Grilli, Italy. The middle slide does show Guadria Grilli, which again was built as a fortress fortification. Um, and in the distance, you see the Maiella Mountains and the countryside uh, adjoining the urban area. I might say for all of you, who are in your early part or middle part of your careers, uh, how great is it for your mother to introduce you at Thanksgiving dinner with the proper title? So um, when I was at Penn State, the slide on the right that I'll talk about in a moment, and thereafter at Harvard, my mother knew that my minor in landscape architecture at Penn State was community development and at Harvard in city and regional planning. So she would introduce me at Thanksgiving dinner to an aunt or uncle who knew little about what I did as this is Tommy, he's a city planner. So I realized when Dr. Durback asked us to do this presentation, um, it was you know, fondly remembering good old Rosaria, um, who was the first relative to ever call me a city planner. My class at Penn State had the good fortune to be there during a time when Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring and uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote the book Population Bomb. Um, and our group has the poster Earth First. We're standing in front of the venerable Sackett Building which was the landscape architecture building at Penn State. And I'm there top left leaning against that column. Um, we kind of defected in our junior year at Penn State in landscape architecture to ask our faculty to take off the blinkers and look at city and town planning from a different perspective. So the group shown in the photo was the group who went to the University of Lisbon uh, from September to December of 1970, uh, during which time we had traveled throughout Western Europe to visit many new towns and new communities to evaluate them. And uh, we also proudly celebrate World Landscape Architecture this month of April, 2021. Let's go to the next slide. So as town planners and landscape architects, we often have to ask ourselves three overarching questions. And those are, where should we build? Where should we not build? And then if we do decide to build, how should we build? So looking at the top left um, picture, that's Westchester, Pennsylvania. And it's a small size borough. And we often, um, which is where TCA um, is located, and we are working towards deciding how to develop, how to revitalize um, the urban area 
and how to conserve the outlying um, more rural uh, areas that should be conserved. The center picture is Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is a very much farm focused um, community. And it's a heritage landscape, um, which is an area that would be one to preserve. So then when we decide where we um, should build, then we need to look at how do we wanna build? So we find it very important to take um, into consideration and decide the principles of building. So at TCA, we look at how we can build context sensitive. Um, we look at the form and composition and the principle um, of the building itself. And then we also look at some of the materials um, that relate to the region to help create it, um, a more context sensitive uh, development. Very good. So um, oftentimes when we are engaged by clients and so far we've worked for 133 municipalities. Currently we represent 23 municipalities and um, we often start off our visioning process by asking questions like if there were one preferred outcome in the next 10 to 20 years in your community, what might it be? And after we ask and answer that question with the stakeholders, we usually have three feedback loops. Um, the second saying, here's what we heard you say at the first meeting. And the third, uh, trying to ratify um, the vision for the place. That all leads to what we first produce as guiding principles. And um, for the large part, over the 40 year period, um, the guiding principles pertain to right sizing, service areas, and an idea on boundaries for city growth. The top left photo is the 1682 plan that William Penn prepared for the city of Philadelphia, the center part of which is City Hall um, in downtown Philadelphia and there are four urban squares, the most valuable of which is in the Northwest Quadrant, which is Rittenhouse Square, where I might add after 300 years is still the most uh, popular, um, hosting a lot of Earth Day, art and civic events. Um, the middle slide, is the service area map that Aaron and I prepared for East Goshen Township, Chester County, Pennsylvania, during which time in the guiding principles idea was to what extent could East Goshen house new commercial development in light of the opportunities already existing in Westchester, Malvern Borough and the Great Valley. So what we did is we identified the service areas for different types of commercial development and pretty much determined that it would be highly unlikely that they could attract within a short travel distance anything that would compete with Westchester or Malvern so that their safe harbor position was to have more boutique shops and stores, mom and pop stores and so forth. Uh, more recently, during COVID and the pandemic, where we've been shuttered in place, there have been a lot of research in the new urbanist arena on revisiting these service areas um, and looking at something called the 15-minute city, um, based in large part on travel time, whether you're a pedestrian walking, five to 10-minute walk to opportunities and resources, whether you're bicycling 10 to 20 minutes from a particular node, or whether you're driving out to what would be 15 minutes, but within that service area, trying to apportion um, all live, work, play, learn, um, recreate um, opportunities. We'll come back to this during the Q&A perhaps. So what are examples 
of best practices in land use planning. Um, what we've shown here, uh, top left is Portland, Oregon, the Metro 2040 plan. And uh, the Portland, Oregon uh, city location, if you liken the image on the left, top left to a clock is at 12 o'clock, the largest purple circle. And from there, what emanates are more uh, suburban um, growth centers that are all knitted together by a light rail network. Um, the Portland Metro 2040 plan was actually first hatched in 1990. And we'll, we'll see what happens by 2039 if they'll make it Metro 2060. But one of the hallmarks of that plan was urban growth boundaries. Um, so essentially, um, what they tried to do to control sprawl in the city of Portland is to incentivize um, walkability and the use of mass transit and thereafter to conserve the countryside. The middle slide showing Seaside, Florida, which was hatched in 1980, often described as Rome to the new urbanist, is only 80 acres in size, which is approximately 36 hectares. And um, it's a best practice model for how to grow a city with a dense urban core that has resources for education, commerce, uh, employment, and then residential opportunities within a very short uh, walking distance. Um, and that is in the Florida panhandle uh, section of the country. Top right shows the Lexington, Kentucky bluegrass region, which in the 1950s was the first regional plan in America. And essentially the conservation areas are shown in the red dots on the eastern side of the region, um, the Lexington city is basically, if you likened it to a clock at nine o'clock in that exhibit. But the key point here from a regional perspective is to try to get land use planning practices right. Realize in 1970, there was an attempt through the, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development to get um, the government to adopt a national urban growth strategy, but they couldn't get enough votes to do it. So to this day, um, here 51 years later, each state and each region is on its own and really can't uh, percolate down from the federal level like they do in the United Kingdom and Germany to come up with a growth strategy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the question would be whether you're a small, medium, large, extra small or extra large city, how might you think about city planning from a holistic standpoint? This slide shows an example of an organizing system called the transect. Those of you who are joining us that are ecologists know uh, from the 1930s, uh, many ecologists um, describing and um, identifying vegetative transects. This one shows a continuum from rural to urban through T1 through T6. And if on the right-hand side, it's an airport or an industrial park or even large college campuses that might fit more into the D district. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll look about applying this. So Aaron and I did the um, Chadsford Township, Delaware County comprehensive plan, a 10 year growth plan where on the right, the predominant green color is the agricultural land, the countryside. 
the growth opportunity areas are along our Route 202, the Wilmington Pike that connects Westchester, Pennsylvania to Wilmington, Delaware. And there's a small village called Chadsford where Andrew Wyeth, the world famous renowned painter and Jamie Wyeth and the Wyeth family uh, lives and lived. But for the most part, uh, as shown on the left, that image shows the transect going from the most urban areas like along the Route 202 Wilmington Pike Corridor to as shown on the top of those three um, illustrations, the rural and agricultural landscape. So in all of the TCA, Thomas Committee Associates plans, we are always striving to strike a balance between where to build and where not to build. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, in terms of the 17 sustainability goals of the United Nations, um, we feel that our number 11 sustainable cities and communities is what this whole presentation is about today. But our 40 year view of the topic area is um, boiled down to three components. Um, and so the relationship that we feel most important to emphasize today to other sustainability considerations is first environment, second economy, and third partnerships. And basically um, we were at a conference um, uh, not long ago where um, it was called Two for the Seesaw, Balancing the Economy and the Environment. And um, essentially, I would say the common theme in all of our work in 40 years has been how to strike this balance between protecting and minimizing adverse effects uh, to the environment while at the same time growing the economy. Well, how do we do this? Uh, we do it through effective stakeholder outreach. The slide on the top right is actually showing a partnership concept that we use in all of our work of, of public outreach. Um, we can call it grassroots public outreach. Uh, this slide happens to illustrate uh, an October 1, 2020 COVID pandemic opportunity outside um, with masks, socially distanced with about 50 stakeholders of this um, village hamlet area called Gradyville near um, Media, Pennsylvania, during which time um, we went and asked people their views and preferences to the future, how they saw um, the area growing over the next 10 to 20 years, uh, what their concerns were in terms of minimizing mm. environmental degradation uh, and trying to maintain the historic character of that village of Gradyville while accommodating uh, growth. And um, the way that we did it actually as part of these feedback loops is to try to forge strong relationships and partnerships with all the stakeholders. The big issue and one that Dr. Gerbach and I had to address in 1994 in Istanbul, Turkey is how do you view population growth? And we realized that uh, the United Nations is predicting the world population to increase by 3 billion in the next 80 years. In the United States, um, the US population in the next 80 years is expected to grow by 121 million. And so um, that would be equivalent to adding three times the current California population. So although Aaron and I would probably want forever in our practice to save that natural cultural and historic environment, 
what we realize is the forces of the economy uh, is at issue and people are coming. So we ask ourselves the question, if people are coming and they need housing, where to put that housing and how to arrange that housing because the lifelong pursuit is to strike that balance, which can only be forged through partnerships because at the end, the failure of anything that we have done, we usually say we failed to properly educate the stakeholders and we've learned enough lessons that we don't have that failure. So the success is to try to strike the balance that when there is an increase in population and housing, and we know that there are areas of the world that are suffering a decrease, even in the United States, and especially during COVID and the pandemic. But in terms of the long-term view, 10, 20, 80 years, the question would be uh, where to build and where not to build. And basically, our principle is to say, what is the most attractive economic force that says where people want to live and grow? And how would we minimize the adverse effects on the environment to allow that growth to happen? Do we do it with urban growth boundaries? Do we do it through very uh, strict and rigid zoning regulations? And the existing habitats, the cities and boroughs and hamlets, where they're not growing more land, the tension is always growing up. And so at what point do you grow up when uh, vertically with taller buildings? Uh, when Dr. Durbach and I were in Istanbul in 1994, there was a 1 million person in migration uh, in Istanbul, which as you know, the Bosporus separates Europe and Asia. So it's actually in two continents. Around the airport in Istanbul in 1994, um, the high rise buildings covered the 360 degree view. Um, one final note uh, on Istanbul, uh, our panel on city planning in 1994 was tasked with what could you do to improve conditions in a city that's increasing by 1 million people per year, had tremendous, horrendous traffic congestion problems, the same thing with air pollution. Uh, we discovered maps from the 1910s that had shown a connected street network. Six of the streets had been cul de sac so they were cut off. Our panel recommended that those six streets would be reopened. To this day, five of them have been reopened. Traffic congestion is less in the inner city. Uh, pollution is less, even though they are struggling to control sprawl and pollution on a daily basis. So um, if we go to the next slide, um, what we'd like to do now is uh, entertain any questions that you might have. Um, and I know Dr. Durback will moderate those. Hi, uh, Tom, thank you very, very much for a very interesting presentation. You're welcome. Um, I, uh, my question is how difficult it is to work with stakeholders and municipalities as opposed to building companies. Uh, <clears throat> great question. Um, I would say in the last 20 years, the municipalities have become much more sophisticated, advanced, their vocabulary has really accelerated about smart growth and sustainability principles. And um, they are very um, vigilant in trying to strike the balance um, most of the time would prefer to keep as compact as possible the walkable mixed use neighborhoods. On the other hand, the developers playing the hand they're dealt, so to speak, 
either have opportunities for revitalizing or redeveloping a section of the city, which most people celebrate because it only adds value. But oftentimes the developers get the fringe locations on the edge of the city or just outside the city boundaries. And that usually um, raises the hair of the municipal officials because most of them are kind of fed up with the development and sprawl that's happened over the last 50 years and would prefer to say no. So part of our challenge is how do you get to yes? How do you strike that balance? And uh, oftentimes we have to justify change based on the population and housing projections, uh, based on resource opportunity, availability of roads, sewer and water, uh, minimizing impact. But if at the end of the day, the growth will have an adverse effect on the environment, we usually recommend that the answer would be no to the development community. Uh, I would say only about 20% of the developers for whom we have worked have a shared vision with the municipalities. The other 80% pretty much say, it's my site. I would like to do whatever I'm allowed to do under the current zoning and uh, regrettably are not as uh, sympathetic toward creating the balance in the future. To what extent uh, do you have control over planners that give you the philosophy that, you know, I bought the land and I can do whatever I want? Uh, how often do you have the cooperation of the municipalities and stakeholders and what do you need to do to obtain it in order to uh, achieve sustainable development practices? Um, very good. Um, <clears throat> Well, all of the images that Aaron and I showed were actually plans and photos of places. But what we do, I would say 60% of each day is we rewrite the zoning codes of municipalities to strengthen their environmental uh, resource protection standards and historic resource protection standards for vulnerable landscapes and on the other side, we rewrite the zoning codes to allow more effective revitalization and rehabilitation in the urban core. So we uh, fortunately enjoy this um, position of being the zoning czars um, now for 23 municipalities um, and overall for 133. So I would say, Anyone who's in this meeting who's trying to determine a career path, if you were to involve yourself with municipal zoning, you would determine in short order that it is a very important control of these issues that can, I'll say, um, mediate the problem and discipline growth from an overall perspective. The problem, Dr. Durback, is that not everyone has the shared vision. Some municipal clients are more interested in growing the tax base and would not worry about losing resources. Others are more concerned about protecting natural, historic, and cultural resources and will do everything in their power to try to direct growth to the growth opportunity areas. But it, it is a lifelong challenge. I would say no fewer than 10 to 12 calls a day are juggling those balls about growth and protection. Okay, this is a question from one of our students. Could you define a little bit more what a stakeholder is in terms of city planning and what do you recommend about the personal economy of the residents and the economy of the city and the stakeholders? Very good. Well, um, most uh, 
planning and zoning initiatives um, that we work on are begun by government agencies. Uh, in our case, we work for townships and boroughs and cities. They invite us to do what we call in Pennsylvania a comprehensive plan, which is a 10 year growth management plan. So the initial stakeholder group is a cross section of elected and appointed officials, whether it's a city council or a township council or a borough council or board of supervisors or in some states called selectmen or freeholders. Um, and essentially that is the core group. Then there is the staff of that municipality that might include the historic commission, parks and recreation commission, conservation commission, planning commission, um, fine arts commission, which also get involved as ad hoc members of a planning initiative. Then there are the neighborhood groups or homeowners associations or business associations. And what we do is we advertise that there's going to be during COVID, a virtual Zoom meeting, during which time we talk about some of the growth issues. Um, and then pre-COVID and post-COVID, meetings that might involve 50 to 200 people at the high school auditorium to um, basically um, discuss future vision for the place, concerns, uh, ideas, aspirations, goals, and try to, again, strike the balance by accommodating projected um, housing and employment opportunities while at the same time trying to minimize adverse environmental effects. Oftentimes, if the municipality has done a good job in the last 20 to 50 years with their finances and budgeting, um, they will opt to strike the balance. We have, however, worked for cities that are rock bottom, that have virtually no vibrant tax base and we often say to them, is there anything that you would not approve? They would approve anything to increase their tax base. And sadly, after five or 10 years of that, the fabric and appearance of the city has changed dramatically. Um, I remember a friend of mine uh, taking uh, Route 95 from Washington, DC to Wilmington, Delaware, and then taking Route 202, that Wilmington Pike that runs through Chadsford. And um, Debbie Novotny said, when she entered Newcastle County, Delaware, she started crying because it was the ugliest sprawl commercial strip landscape she had seen in the whole United States. And the lack of planning in that Route 202 corridor in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s created that sprawl environment. So um, it's, it's a lifelong goal to try to balance economy and environment, but sadly often is decided by the elected officials based on their wish to grow their tax base. Uh, thank you, Fred. And I see that uh, uh, Fred has a couple of questions that he would like to ask you, Fred. Thank you, uh, Tom and Aaron, for the insightful presentation. You're welcome. Uh, so this question is coming from um, uh, the audience. So um, could you, um, OK, this one is from Daniel. Um, so nowadays, skyscrapers are built by the integrated anti-earthquake technology. Can this technique uh, meet any modernization in the nearest future? Very good. Um, well, let's first talk about the word skyscraper and what is it and how have certain cities um, tried to reconcile. Um, so I wanna start with Berlin, Germany, where after World War II, uh, they had to rebuild portions of the city. They only used three rules for zoning. One was no building would be greater than six stories in height in downtown Berlin. 
They've since changed that for the Potsdamer plots where the Sony Center is 12 stories. But um, the three rules in Berlin were no building taller than six stories. That was number one rule. The second was the building should adjoin the sidewalk. And the third one is the ground floor would be non-residential. So realize with all this fancy talking about planning and zoning, for 40 years, the city of Berlin grew gracefully with just three rules. What's happened, however, because of urban economics is buildings are way taller than six stories. 110 stories was the World Trade Center. Uh, some of the buildings in Manhattan, New York, USA are over 110 stories today. But um, the architect who did the structural engineering at the World Trade Center passed away last year. And um, one of the sad parts that was related in his obituary in the New York Times was how he lamented the fact that he didn't make that building. So we've learned enough lessons on the buildings that have fallen down that presumably um, that won't happen very much in the future, unless there is a building department in some remote area of the world that doesn't have the same code requirements as, for example, Chicago. The other question, uh, Tom, is there any risk that planners and architects will uh, be replaced by technology? Ah, <laughs> um, well, it's a good question, but I want to tell a quick story about a, um, a zoning project that Aaron and I worked on in media, Pennsylvania, called the Core Overlay District. And whatever ideas we had were denounced by the stakeholders. Uh, they basically said, we don't like anything, go away. Um, we know NIMBY means not in my backyard. And they had banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere never again. And so uh, what we found by in-person processing of the complaints is when we asked the persons who were opposed to all development and redevelopment, why do you oppose that? And people say, well, the high rise building would create a shadow on the sidewalk. And then we would say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, we can't have outdoor dining in the cafe. And why do you feel bad about that? Well, we don't want to go to a franchise restaurant out in the suburbs. During the break, the woman said, the real reason we didn't want you to change that building is I had my wedding reception there. I don't think the robots can be uh, programmed to cultivate the discussion to actually get at the nerve center of why people are opposed to everything. And what we find as the beauty of processing in person is we can drill down and ask a number of questions to get at the root issue of why people are opposed to everything. Fred? Excellent. Uh, do you have another question? Yes, there's more and more questions coming in. Um, this one is from um, Vadim says, good afternoon, thanks for the invitation. And I have a, questions for, a question for Tom. Which city is the best and worst for you and why? In terms of city planning. Sure, uh, I would say Savannah, Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina would rank above, the, uh, rank among the best because uh, Oglethorpe in, the 1600s in Savannah hatched a very effective growth management strategy, which downtown Savannah embraces to today. And each block has as its core, a 10 acre park. Um, Charleston, South Carolina, owing primarily to hydrologic constraints is kind of a defined uh, compact area. So I would say, um, my two best practice examples would be Savannah, Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina. 
as far as the worst is concerned, um, I would say it's any city who has unbridled sprawl where the character of the place is no longer visible. Uh, tonight, I will be at a place that has one of everything um, between two limited access routes, the Pennsylvania Turnpike and Interstate 95 that connects Florida to Maine. And um, they basically would accept uh, casinos, um, outlet centers, um, and every other form of commercial use wherever anyone wanted to place it. So that um, when you go there, you go through very quickly because there's nothing that draws your attention to want to stay and linger to dine or take photos or uh, go for a canoe ride or a walk or a bicycle ride. Um, thank you, Fred. Uh, Tom, this is a question, another question. What are the economically and ecologically advantages and disadvantages of overgrowth and undergrowth sub, uh, structures and subways. What do you choose for a big city in the 21st century? Very good. Um, well, um, let, let me first um, tee it up in three ways. One is, in about 1952 in Hilton Head, South Carolina, they hatched a master plan where the founder was asked by Time Magazine and his photo was on the cover in 1952, uh, what is the magic of Hilton Head? And Charles Frazier said, it's the highest and best environmentally sensitive use. What the New York Times correspondent failed to report what are the words environmentally sensitive use. So the appraisal industry has embraced highest and best use, which is a very uh, informal opinion that most people try to use to justify anything anywhere. Um, now, in terms of uh, another principle that when I was in graduate school at Harvard, we were taught about maximizing attractiveness and minimizing impact. At the University of Pennsylvania, Ian McCarg talked about intrinsic suitability. So if you were at a highway interchange and all four quadrants had agricultural soils, McCarg said, don't build on them, save the farmland. At Harvard, we were told when you get out of school, people aren't gonna be as sympathetic toward farmland. And the question will be, where to build and how to build. And the point would be, if development is attracted to a highway interchange, how could it be most graceful and minimize the impact so it's just not all asphalt, where you tear down all the trees and drain the wetlands and regrade the slopes. So it's all about mitigating adverse impacts. So if the roots and the foundation of the planning of the city or municipality is holistically intertwined between their budget, the economy, the tax structure, quality of life, uh, graceful city planning, a balance, not having pollution, flooding, horrendous stormwater issues, um, odor problems or whatever. It all has to work interconnected to think about the most attractive outcome that minimizes impact and practical places for right-sizing the development in particular areas with the hope that it minimizes the economic crunch that occurs of increasing taxes or having additional uh, municipal expenditures. 
And I hope that that sort of framed an answer for that question. Uh, thank you, Tom. Here's another one. In your opinion, is it a good idea to destroy the historic part of the city with modern buildings? <laughs> um, well, let's go to beautiful downtown Berlin at what was called Checkpoint Charlie in 1946. If you go to Checkpoint Charlie and you could Google Earth it, uh, go from that point three blocks in each direction. And to their credit, the Berlin city planner said, if it's no taller than six stories, it adjoins the sidewalk and has ground floor non-residential, it's all good. Well, when you go to downtown Berlin, Germany, in those three blocks in each cardinal direction from Checkpoint Charlie, so named because of the soldiers who occupied Berlin during World War II. You could go in each of the three blocks and you would go past three traditional buildings. Then you would go past the Frank Gehry building that looks like crinkled aluminum foil. Then another two historic buildings and then another modern building. And what the city of Berlin, Germany said, as long as you repack respect the urbanism of lining the buildings up along the sidewalk. We don't mind if it's modern or traditional. The same principle was embraced by the Czech Republic in Prague, where the two buildings called Fred and Ginger that emulate the dancers Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers was designed by Frank Gehry in the most historic section of Prague. The city planners in Prague said, we celebrate urbanism. We're not going to regulate style as long as the buildings are in alignment and at the same height of the historic fabric of the city, it's okay. This issue of style is debated at great length at CNU, Congress of New Urbanism uh, Congresses, because a lot of traditional architects really hate the modern buildings, but the more contemporary new urbanists say, we are not ruling out any style of architecture. Don't put a parking lot in front of the building. Don't interrupt the pedestrian experience of strolling in front of buildings, but if it has to be modern, so be it. So that is one of the principles in the charter of the new urbanism. If you wanna read more about it, um, just go to cnu.org and then go to the link on the charter of the new urbanism and you'll find this uh, discussion on style. In um, 1970, I attended the University of Lisbon in Portugal and in the northern section of Portugal, it's very steeply sloping and what they have done is perfected a tourist system of city building and agriculture. It's also what you find in the Amalfi Coast in Italy at the town of Ravello, for example, where it's at the top of the mountain and owing to switchback um, sinusoidal curved streets winding your way up, they have actually tourist that city at the top of the mountain as are many other cities in Italy. So, what Aaron and I do is we write slope regulations and we talk about certain slopes to be conserved and protected, but if they have to be encroached upon, we have mitigation techniques that involve terracing as is performed and perfected in uh, Portugal and in Italy. All right, I must say it is wonderful to have somebody that has 38 years of experience, or should I say, excuse me, I think it's 48 years of experience in all this work. So uh, there's another question right here. Uh, it just says it's for Tom. Mr. Thomas, a completely ecological city, utopia or reality? Um, I think it's a reality. Uh, let's look at Toronto, Canada. 
where in the last 15 years, they have unearthed the Don D-O-N River. So in the 1930s and 40s, they pretty much paved over the whole city of Toronto. And owing to some very um, sustainable, ecologically minded architects and planners in Toronto, what they have done is they have reclaimed the Don River and its tributaries to create a linear park system so that um, the streams that were put into pipes are now these lovely open air um, valleys um, that have parkland, uh, community agricultural spaces, uh, and some institutional uses like schools and universities. Uh, I know it's a tall order to go in the reverse direction because of the private land ownership. Um, fortunately in Canada, they were able over a period of time to acquire the properties that were transformed back to their pre-1930 condition. But I would say if we're successful in doing it in the next 80 years, we have to have more examples than just Toronto, Canada. Uh, in the meantime, let's use Toronto as the sterling example, and then let's create some other good examples. I think it also happens vertically, like at the High Line in New York City as a vertical stack. Also, the Reading Terminal Aqueduct in Philadelphia is like the High Line, and there are about eight cities across the country who have done it. Uh, I also say in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Milwaukee River from the industrial district to downtown Milwaukee was completely reclaimed. Um, and we also know in San Antonio, the Riverwalk as a whole series of canals, but realize this, it took some very courageous political capital to make those projects happen. But there are some good, good examples out there, Toronto, Milwaukee, San Antonio among them. Uh, thank you. That's uh, wonderful that you were brought uh, that, those examples up. I also wanted to ask you, and this is personal, what is your favorite city, uh, particularly in Europe? Um, I would say, uh, since I'm a toy collector, Gingen in Germany, that has the Steiff factory, <laughs> but um, otherwise, I would think uh, Rotenburg, Germany, that um, was studied by Sir Raymond Unwin and inspired his design for Hempstead Garden Suburb. Uh, Rotenburg is a fortified city. It has a lovely street network, many um, kind of seamlessly arranged building types and a lot of good public space. So I would say in my dream tonight, I'm gonna to go to Rotenburg. <laughs> well, uh, Tom, thank you very, very much for an extremely interesting, informative and brilliant presentation. And right. I'm most grateful that you found the time to be with us. Erin, I would like to ask you uh, and thank you uh, for the help that you have given in this presentation. And uh, uh, Fred uh, and uh, Ariel, thank you for being there and helping us with uh, this uh, virtual voices presentation. So uh, all I would like to do now is thank you again and wish you a very, very nice, healthy, day and continue on to reach at least 50 years in your work. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.